Hello out there, all my bookish friends in booktube land, and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this video, we're doing a book haul. Six books, five of which are modern classics of the 20th century. So without further ado, let's get stuck in, shall we? If you watched my video on May book haul, or it might have been June's book haul, I think it was May, you'll have heard me tell the story about the wonderful um, isolated industrial unit full of books that uh, my wife told me about. Well, all of the books in this video are from that paradise of pages and plenty. The other one, well, I'll come to that later. The sixth book that I'll be talking about is different to the others in that it's not a classic. It's a non-fiction book, but you, when we come to it, you'll see why I've chosen to read it and put it on uh, my classics booktube. So let's get on with the others. The first book in the book haul is Scoop by Evelyn Waugh. Have you read Scoop? Uh, what did you think? Leave a comment down below because this is classed by a lot of people as War's masterpiece. It's him at his satirical and comical best. The story behind Scoop has got some hijinks involved in it and it's where War, who was a journalist himself, takes on the newspaper industry and their constant um, avaricious quest to get a Scoop at all costs. Now in this you have a Lord Copper who is a newspaper magnate. And he hears that there's going to be a war in a country called Ishmaelia, Nadop country, which is in the African continent. And he thinks it's going to be a nice little war in the sense that you can drum up some excitement for it and some action. And if you can get someone to get a good scoop about the war, he'll sell lots and lots of newspapers. So to that end, he hires someone to go to Ishmaelia and get some news stories for him. But he makes a mistake. You see, at this time, there is an author called, I think it is, John Theodore Boot, who sells about 15,000 copies of his stuff a year, and is quite renowned in certain circles. But there's also another John Boot who works in Lord Copper's um, firm down in some lowly area where he writes little snippets about nature. Lord Copper thinks that this John Boot is the same as the famous author John Theodore Boot. So he summons him and says, I want to send you to Ishmaelia and you're going to get me a big story about the war over there. Get me the scoop, hence the title. And then the book basically follows the journey of this innocent John Boot who is totally out of his depth and has no idea what he's doing to get a massive journalistic story in an environment that he's really not used to. And then, of course, it's rounded out and the, all the plot is satisfied towards the end. Sounds good, doesn't it? And if you've read it, go ahead, leave a comment down below and, and tell me what you have thought of it. Or is it a book that you've got on your to-be-read list? Anyway, let's read, as is our want on this channel, the first paragraph of the book. While still a young man, John Courtney Boot had, as his publisher proclaimed, achieved an assured and enviable position in contemporary letters. His novels sold 15,000 copies in their first year and were read by the people whose opinion John Boot respected. Between novels, he kept his name sweet in intellectual circles with unprofitable but modish works on history and travel. His signed first editions sometimes changed hands at a shilling or two above their original price. He had published eight books, beginning with A Life of Rimbord, written when he was 18, and concluding at the moment with Waste of Time, a studiously modest description of some harrowing months among the Patagonian Indians, of which most people who lunch with Lady Metroland could remember the names of three or four. He had many charming friends, of whom the most valued was the lovely Mrs Algernon Stitch. So that was the first paragraph of our first book, Scoop by Evelyn Waugh. Now, recently, and I'll be mentioning this in my monthly wrap-up, I read Cannery Row by John Steinbeck, and it was really, really good. So when I saw another Steinbeck waiting to be snaffled in a crate, I grabbed it immediately. And this book is Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. I know for a lot of my American viewers out there, many of you will have read this at high school or at college. 
Did you see any difference between it when you read it at high school and when you matured a few more years? Um, and what were your thoughts of it going through it at high school? Did it have an impact? Now the book itself recounts the tale of the Joad family, I think they're called, and they are leaving the Oklahoma Dust Bowls because in Oklahoma there have been lots of droughts, um, bank foreclosures on farms, unemployment, and so people are moving away from Oklahoma trying to start a new life. Now the Joad family take their trip along to sunny California and the book recounts their experiences on the way and they actually meet people coming away from California because there's problems there. And so that obvious quandary comes up, you know, are we really going to make a better life? Are we really making the right choices? Now Steinbeck is a fabulous writer. I, am, I love his style. And uh, I'll just give a quick shout out here to one of my subscribers, Jason, who often DMs me through Instagram, as well as some of you others. And he's been going on about Steinbeck to me for a good while, especially East of Eden, which I will eventually be getting to. But Steinbeck's really growing on me, so I'm looking forward to reading Grapes of Wrath as well. One thing I really like about Steinbeck is he doesn't just write a story, although he writes brilliant stories. He always is exploring some idea or motif through his works. Now, not having read this, I checked up to see what some scholars have said about this work. And it seems in this one that there is an undercurrent of the ideas of Christianity. Not that he's propounding Christianity or advising it, but what Steinbeck's very good at is he gets an idea, normally a philosophy, and makes it concrete in a story. So instead of an intangible idea, a concrete representation of the idea in people. And from what I've heard about this, there are two characters that will play a role, which some suggest represent Christ before his death and Christ after his resurrection. So that will be interesting to see what angle he gets on that. And that adds to your own universe of characters and ideas, which I've discussed in another video of mine on uh, why read the classics. So let's read the first paragraph, shall we? To the red country and part of the great country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently and they did not cut the scarred earth. The ploughs crossed and recrossed the rivulet marks. The last rains lifted the corn quickly and scattered weed colonies and grass along the sides of the roads so that the grey country and the dark red country began to disappear under a green cover. In the last part of May, the sky grew pale and the clouds that had hung in high puffs for so long in the spring were dissipated. The sun flared down on the growing corn day after day until a line of brown spread along the edge of each green bayonet. The clouds appeared and went away, and in a while they did not try any more. The weeds grew darker green to protect themselves, and they did not spread any more. The surface of the earth crusted, a thin, hard crust, and as the sky became pale, so the earth became pale. Pink in the red country, and white in the grey country. <laughs> That's very atmospheric language, don't you agree? Already I'm thinking of the dust bowls quite vividly in my mind. So, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, have you read it? Third in this book haul is almost becoming a forgotten classic, um, even though there's a film been made of it. I know I watched the film years ago, but I can't remember anything about it. So whether the film was any good, I don't know. Anyway, that book is Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee. So this book is sort of a reminiscence. It is a story, but it's Laurie Lee's personal reminiscences of life in a Cotswold village in the early part of the 20th century. Now the Cotswolds, in case you don't know, they are sort of your quintessential English village hamlet. You know when you watch Cranford and Lark Rise to Candleford and you see those yellow stone old buildings and the beautiful surrounding rolling countryside which is neither too high nor too flat. That's the Cotswolds, sort of in the centre of Britain. Laurie Lee himself lived in the village of Slade or Slade. It's spelled S-L-A-D and even though I live in England you probably know the English have some very curiously named places, and I don't always know how to pronounce them. But anyway, the way Laurie Lee goes about this story is not necessarily a sequential 
sort of plot that develops and opens up, but he goes through it by topic. So he starts when he's just a very little nipper being introduced to the village. And then he'll move on to like names, getting to know people by their names and nicknames. And then there'll be um, school and school life and various aspects of village life, which gradually accumulate to give this rounded image of a world which was idyllic, which was peaceful, and which gave way eventually to the modern world where everything has changed and we've lost the sense of the time that has gone by. Now, I can't do better to give you an idea of this book than to read the back, because, well, you'll see why. We came to the village in the summer of the last year of the First World War, to a cottage that stood in a half acre of garden on a steep bank above a lake. A cottage with three floors and a cellar and a treasure in the walls, with a pump and apple trees, syringa and strawberries, rooks in the chimneys, frogs in the cellar, mushrooms on the ceiling, and all for three and sixpence a week. Laurie Lee's account of growing up in a remote Cotswold village is one of the great classics of the 20th century. In sharp, sensuous prose, he evokes an England long since vanished, a world of silence, of hard work, and necessary patience, of villages like ships in the empty landscapes and the long walking distances between them. A world where right to the end, the old life seemed as lusty as ever. Do you know, some blurb writers should get an award because just reading that makes me want to read the book immediately. So Cider with Rosie by Laurie Lee is the third book and I'll just read you the opening to it. I was set down from the carrier's cart at the age of three and there with a sense of bewilderment and terror my life in the village began. The June grass amongst which I stood was taller than I was and I wept. I'd never been so close to grass before. It towered above me and all around me, each blade tattooed with tiger skins of sunlight. It was knife-edged, dark and wicked green, thick as a forest and alive with grasshoppers that chirped and chattered and leapt through the air like monkeys. Isn't that just sublime writing? <laughs> I mean, that that's so evocative. That tattooed with tiger-striped sunlight, you know, as the light cuts across the grass. I mean, I remember a being a child and noticing that detail in front of me. So it's already took me back to being three years of age. Just brilliant. Our next book is a book that I wasn't aware even existed. I'd never heard about it before. And when I began looking into it, I found that it actually had quite a big effect on a certain um, writing genre. And that book is Ashenden by Somerset Maugham. Have you read Ashenden? Have you even heard of Ashenden? Because I certainly hadn't. Ashenden itself is based on Somerset Maugham's own experiences when he worked for counterintelligence. Now, Maugham was a writer, and then the British Secret Service got in touch with him and said, would you mind doing some intelligence work for us, basically spying and going to Switzerland? Um, and he said, because he's a romantic, okay, why not? Which I absolutely love, you know, just to snatch an opportunity like that when you've got no training in it. So based on his experiences working as a spy in intelligence, he writes Ashenden. Now he does admit that he fleshes things out because he says fact is a very poor storyteller, it's too haphazard. And in this book, you have, it's like short stories um, but they're all connected because they're all around this guy called Ashenden. Now, Ashenden's the surname. You never get to hear his first name. Um, and it all pulls together, apparently. But there's, they're all different little experiences as he travels to Italy and he travels to Russia and there's a Greek person involved. So it's quite eclectic, but jointed at the same time. Like I say, I'd never even heard of this. But it doesn't just focus on the the thrills and spills of the classic spy genre as we think of it, like James Bond. Rather, this was a forerunner of the skeptical spy genre, where the spy story is infused with humanity. Because apparently within all of his stories in this book, there is some affecting or comical character to whom something will happen or to someone near them, something happens to them. And so it's not just 
a chase story or a detective story, it touches on people being alive during all of this. It is their lives. And of course, the greatest exponent of this would be John le Carre. So you think of the spy who came in from the cold. It's not just a spy story. It brings in humaneness, humanity. Um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, another one where you get to feel for the classic villain, as it were, that he is just another man, the same as the British spy is an ordinary man. So, have you read it? Have you heard of it? Is it just news to you? I'm actually looking forward to reading this. Being as it's broken into semi-small stories, um, I'm looking forward to reading this one in bed before going to sleep. I think that's the way I'm going to enjoy this one. So, that was the next book, Ashenden by Somerset Maugham, and I'll just read you how it opens. It was not till the beginning of September that Ashenden, a writer by profession, who had been abroad at the outbreak of the war, managed to get back to England. He chanced, soon after his arrival, to go to a party and was there introduced to a middle-aged colonel whose name he did not catch. He had some talk with him. As he was about to leave, this officer came up to him and asked, I say, I wonder if you'd mind coming to see me. I'd rather like to have a chat with you. Certainly, said Ashenden, whenever you like. What about tomorrow, at eleven? All right. I'll just write down my address. Have you a card on you? And that's how Ashenden's life in counterintelligence begins. The fifth book in my book haul is by the great writer George Orwell, and this one is slightly lesser known, but quite well respected, The Road to Wigan Pier. Interesting story behind this book. George Orwell was actually asked to go and write about the state of the working poor in the north of England. Now, the north of England is classically known as being um, poorer than the south. It's where your hard labourers are. They're an uncouth lot, you know, if you go by the, the southerners' version of them. And they're, they're talk like that, you know, hey up, lad. All right, so quite a, a northern accent. The north in England in the 19th century was where a lot of the mills started. Great, massive coal mines were up there, which powered the country. And so when Orwell went to Wigan and to Barnsley and to other northern cities and dossed in the common man's houses... He got to see what it was like for the poor of the United Kingdom. He was actually asked to write this by uh, an institution called the Left Book Club, so I'm guessing socialists. And that's where this book apparently is very interesting, because the way George Orwell moves through it, he first takes a look at the living conditions of the poor, he looks at the way they work as a community, the things they eat, conditions down the mine. And then apparently the book takes a bit of a swing after that and Orwell starts to have a look at the idea of socialism and acknowledges that in essence socialism, where everyone works for the good of everyone else, not just in the community but the whole country for the benefit of everybody, is, you know, who wouldn't want that? It's an ideal system. So why did so many of the poor and the labourers reject socialism? A lot of people in the higher middle class and in government thought they were just idiots. But Orwell tries to point out the reasons why, without any selfishness, they push against that idea. And he says, he tries to show through the book that there's reason behind it. Whether they're right or wrong, I don't think Orwell actually states. But what he does point out is people have reasons for believing and acting as they do, or not accepting an ideology which sounds so good on the face of it. <laughs> what tickles me is that the Left Book Club, when this was printed, found it necessary for their members to write um, a foreword which explained away a lot of George Orwell's thoughts and comments in this book. But have you read it, The Road to Wigan Pier? Um, do you like George Orwell? Are you an Orwellian or do you not like his style at all? Put your thoughts in the comments below. So let's read the first paragraph, shall we? The first sound in the mornings was the clumping of the mill girls' clogs down the cobbled street. Earlier than that, I suppose, there were factory whistles which I was never awake to hear. 
There were generally four of us in the bedroom, a beastly place it was, with that defiled, impermanent look of rooms that are not serving their rightful purpose. Years earlier, the house had been an ordinary dwelling house, and when the Brookers had taken it and fitted it out as a tripe shop and lodging house, they had inherited some of the more useless pieces of furniture and had never had the energy to remove them. We were, therefore, sleeping in what was still recognisably a drawing room. Hanging from the ceiling, there was a heavy glass chandelier on which the dust was so thick that it was like fur. And covering most of one wall, there was a huge hideous piece of junk, something between a sideboard and a hall stand with lots of carving and little drawers and strips of looking glass. And there was a once gaudy carpet ringed with the slop pails of years, and two gilt chairs with berth seats, and one of those old-fashioned horsehair armchairs which you slide off when you try to sit on them. The room had been turned into a bedroom by thrusting four squalid beds in among this other wreckage. Well, that's a happy opening, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it paints the picture really well. You're already in that depressed, almost dark, sepia tone of narration, um, which is quite cloying and dry in the throat, as it were. So, uh, yes, The Road to Wigan Pier by George Orwell. The last book in my monthly book haul is a non-fiction one, and I didn't buy it, it was given to me. So, Jill, if you're watching, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate your supporting my channel and giving me this book. It is Mythos by Stephen Fry. Now, this is recently printed, and it's not a classic book. However, in this book, Stephen Fry, who speaks Latin fluently, is just erudite and eloquent and very well versed in practically everything, he has a passion for Greek mythology and, and antiquities. And so in this, he lays out sort of the myths of the Greek pantheon of gods, which is really useful when you're reading classic literature because it refers to the gods so much. And so to have a book as a reference where you can look at the stories of the gods and understand the way the Greeks thought about them and if there's any messages behind it, the effect of Greek philosophy uh, upon our development as a culture, then this is going to be such a useful book to read. And I can't wait to read it because Stephen Fry is so smooth and crisp in the way he narrates things. So have you read Mythos? Have you heard of this? I think a lot will have. Uh, when I finished it, I'll do a quick five minute video of my thoughts about it and how useful it is to understanding any of the classic literature we refer to. I just want to say thank you to everyone else as well who has contacted me asking if they can send me books or if it can help me in some way on my channel. Um, as you know, those of you in America that have offered to send me things, because of the import situation in Britain, sometimes you can be slapped with an import charge like 15, 20 pounds for a book being sent, which is worth more than the book. And also, often it gets lost. So I wouldn't want someone to send me a book and then I never show it on my book channel and look totally unappreciative <laughs> because it's not my fault, it's stuck somewhere in a cargo hold. So as you know, that's the reason why I've said, oh, don't send me a book just yet. If you do want to help contribute to my channel and help me uh, in developing it and with the time it takes to invest in it, as of yet, I have no idea what to say to you. If you're in Britain and you want to send me a book like this was, then by all means, just DM me in my Instagram and I'll give you my address and you can send me the book. But um, other than that, I don't quite know how people can help me. If you've got ideas, then I'd love to hear them because I'm trying to grow my channel and um, it, it does take a lot of hard work to do it. But please don't think this a begging message. Certainly not. Terrible form. Wouldn't dream of it. No, no, no. So I hope that you have enjoyed this video covering all these books. Let me know in the comments down below which one sounds good to you, which one you think, oh, I might go out and get that. Um, or if there's any surprises that you've never heard of here, like Ashenden, for me, never heard of that book before. Sounds great. Anyway, until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.